Attorney General William Barr testified before the House Judiciary Committee yesterday in a long-delayed hearing into his leadership of the Department of Justice. Now, we might expect that this hearing would have had more fireworks than a Portland protest, and we would be right. A.G. Barr was in the firing line from the very beginning of the hearing. Well, at least from when Representative Jerry Nadler, the chair of the committee, showed up after being delayed by a minor traffic accident. Why, though, did the House Judiciary Committee want Barr to testify? Was it because of his job performance, or was it another reason? After watching the fireworks, I believe that it's time for some roasted opinions. Now, William Barr has been Attorney General twice, having first joined the DOJ in 1989 as Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel. In just over a year, he was promoted to Deputy Attorney General, and in less than three years, he became the Attorney General under George H.W. Bush. When in 1993, President Bill Clinton replaced him with A.G. Janet Reno, Barr returned to private practice as a corporate lawyer, adding a further 25 years to the nine years he had accumulated in the late 1970s and early 80s. During those early years, he also spent a total of eight years working for the government in other capacities, as a CIA analyst, a law clerk, and as a member of Reagan's policy staff. Barr's reputation in Washington was that of a staunch conservative who was a friend of Robert Mueller. As such, and due to his record, he was recommended to President Trump as a replacement for the departing Jeff Sessions. His confirmation was affirmed by a fairly slim majority despite, or perhaps because of, his reputation, just as most appointments by President Trump have been. Since that time, A.G. Barr has been busy dealing with a Department of Justice which is rife with scandal. First, there was the Russiagate hearings, which were fed by DOJ activities which, if viewed through a nonpartisan lens, smacked of underhanded activities involving making false statements to the FISA courts, to Congress, and to the President. Then there were endless follow-up investigations of everything that the sitting president ordered his cabinet to do. Finally, in February, the House Judiciary Committee demanded that Barr appear before them to answer questions about his activities on President Trump's behalf. The only reason that these hearings weren't ongoing in March, as the primary season was in full swing, and as the Democratic frontrunner was emerging, was due to the never-to-be-sufficiently-damned COVID-19 outbreak, which put most of the world on hold. It's difficult to hold hearings in the House of Representatives when the Speaker sends everyone out on remote working arrangements, after all. Yet the Democratic leaders in the House took issue with Barr not appearing, perhaps because he refused to appear before them during the impeachment hearings when he had been on the job for just a few months. There are only two possible reasons for convening these hearings now. Either the President is actively breaking the law and should be impeached, or to influence the election by convincing the voters that the President is breaking the law and should be impeached. In either case, the point of these hearings would be to remove President Trump from office. Presumably, that would also result in A.G. Barr leaving office, hence Barr's side of the fireworks. And as for Representative Nadler and the House Judiciary Committee, well, they don't like Trump. They want to see him gone, and have since before he took office, and they certainly have a vested interest in touching off as much controversy as possible. Given those facts, I suppose that it's no surprise that the hearing rapidly devolved into the Democratic members berating the AG at length. What was a bit surprising and disgusting was the venomous tone of the majority members. Barr was all but accused of complicity in the murders of every person who has died during the protests. He naturally began to respond to that allegation, but the member reclaimed their time. Barr was also accused of being the president's replacement fixer after the conviction of Michael Cohen. Again, he began to respond, but the member reclaimed their time. He was accused of complicity in the supposed failure of the Trump administration in dealing with COVID. Response attempted. Time reclaimed. Ditto interfering in the Russiagate investigation. Response attempted. Time reclaimed. Even when he was accused of attempting to collapse the U.S. healthcare system and began to respond as to why he had a vested interest in preserving it because both of his daughters are cancer survivors, time reclaimed. Over a dozen times, rudely, even in some instances quite vindictively, the majority members reclaimed their time instead of allowing him to answer. They were evidently interested in having their rhetorical allegations heard, not hearing him answer their questions. I'll try to explain why before a member of the House Judiciary Committee shows up in my house to reclaim their time. The fact is that this is an election year, and Donald Trump is the Democrat Party's boogeyman. 
They are happy to make the president and his appointees look like partisan hacks in public, even if they also have to look like partisan hacks themselves to do it. What worries do the committee members have, after all? The press is largely friendly to them, having decided before Trump was elected that he was the Antichrist and had to be removed from office. Nothing that Trump has done has escaped a wall of criticism, whether he's executing his duties or just taking a day off. Every statement by the president has provoked another round of shocked gasps. Some of those statements deserved shocked gasps, if, that is, he was accurately quoted. Most of the outrage is manufactured, though. The press needs to sell. The Democratic Party needs to blunt the positive impact of the Trump presidency so that they don't lose seats in Congress. Even never-Trumpers have an ulterior motive as they battle a president who is popular with the Republican Party over control of the RNC. There's a lot of really vocal people who have been screaming for over four years about how horrible Donald Trump is. We might think that they would get hoarse, but the screams show no signs of abating. After all, they seem to be working. Trump's approval numbers have never gone over 50% and have slipped in the last few months. Meanwhile, we can look around at what's happening. Some cities have surpassed 50 consecutive days of protests, which the press constantly reminds America are largely peaceful, despite the fact that businesses are being looted, buildings burned, public and private property defaced, and people attacked and even killed. Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf responded to ongoing attacks on a federal courthouse in Portland, Oregon, by deploying Federal Protective Service agents. Oregon Governor Kate Brown demanded that the federal agents be removed, going so far as to claim that they had no jurisdiction in Oregon. Wolf reminded her that federal agents have jurisdiction anywhere in the United States, especially on federal property, so she had her attorney general file suit. The Ninth Circuit judge that was assigned to the case found that while the protesters could file suit, the state of Oregon had no standing to file such a claim. So Brown and Vice President Pence had a chat, with Wolf sitting in on the meeting. The federal government agreed to remove their agents as soon as the Oregon State Police had gained control of the situation. Governor Brown agreed to deploy the OSP to remove that threat. Everyone satisfied, right? Then Governor Brown tweeted that the federal forces would be removed from Oregon, leading out that OSP had to end the threat to federal property first. Naturally, Acting Secretary Wolf published a press release which included those facts at roughly the same time. Brown believes that she has outmaneuvered Wolf, because if the federal agents aren't removed, then she is certain to denounce the Trump administration as liars for not removing them. Wolf only has to provide evidence that the threat hasn't ended to show that he hasn't abrogated the agreement, but take a wild guess at how the news reports will be written. Meanwhile, COVID-19 has had most of the country in lockdown for so long that only the strongest businesses are showing profits, while unemployment soars and people beg for help. Congress is sympathetic. Both houses are working on a second round of relief, but the Senate is stuck wrangling over what aid should be included in their $1 trillion bill, and the House passed a bloated bill filled with unrelated measures from the progressive wish list with a $3 trillion price tag. That's $3 trillion in supplemental appropriations, when the 2020 budget passed last year was $4.829 trillion. While the Senate finalizes and passes their version, the House is busy denouncing the Senate leadership as tight-fisted, cold-hearted Trump sycophants, all dutifully reported by the press in a spectacular display of one-sided coverage. I wonder if the press is following the Democratic National Committee's marching orders, or if the DNC is dancing to the press's tune. The Democratic challenger stopped mounting an active campaign in March when the country largely closed for business and has hid in his basement ever since. A wise precaution given the fact that he's 77, has an unbelievable capacity for keeping his foot in his mouth, argues with his own supporters, demonstrates a fading grasp on reality, and is about as exciting in person as watching grass grow. The only people actively campaigning against Trump are the so-called peaceful protesters, the Democratic members in Congress, and the press. Biden certainly isn't. Then again, he may be too busy completing the multiple cognitive tests he claimed to be taking to campaign. There will be no big national party conventions this year, just some overblown Zoom meetings in which the delegates will participate. Therefore, we can expect to see little in the way of convention bounce just before the debates. As for the debates, Biden stands little chance of coming off as anything but an empty suit even with the moderators tossing him softball questions. The only way that he will win the debates in the minds of the voters, whose opinions truly matter in November, is if Trump strikes out swinging at fastballs. These hearings, much like the negative press coverage of Trump and the protests, are effectively Biden's campaign. In an unusual situation, 
It's politics as usual in Washington.